was an empire that rose out of the ashes of barbarian conquest, straddled 15 time zones, and swallowed one-sixth of the entire world's landmass. And the first thing to deal with is just this enormous size. Fueled by 400 years of chaos, the Russian Empire was forged by a lion's den of larger-than-life czars, whose tyrannical designs were as colossal as the country itself. She wrote to one of her correspondents, I can't stop myself from building. Building is like a disease. It's almost like alcoholism. These visionaries would drive Russia's rise to greatness, adapting foreign technologies to seize power, capture territory, and engineer an empire. But the same drive that fueled Russia's thirst for everlasting glory would ultimately devour its own people. Moscow. An up-and-coming Russian leader is making an unprecedented play for power. His name is Ivan III. For centuries, his people have been under the thumb of Eurasia's most brutal conquerors, a Mongol sect called the Tatars. But now, Ivan III would gamble everything to take them down. In one move, he tears up the pact, binding him to the Tatars, and declares Russia his. In the balance hangs the future of the Russian people. If Ivan loses, it means his life. If he wins, Russia will become the land of the Tsars. Hello, I'm Peter Weller. Some say the history of Russia is a history of its great cities. Now, what we think of as Russia today actually began in the ninth century, when a very diverse people started to coalesce around a single dominant clan called the Kievan Rus. The Kievan Rus were from the Ukraine, but they migrated here to a very forested area around many rivers and lakes and started a small trading hamlet called Novgorod, meaning new city. Oral tradition tells us that life in Novgorod was so chaotic and so tumultuous that the people actually invited a Viking warrior named Ruik from across the Baltic Sea to come here and establish order. In Novgorod, the Kievan Rus flourished. They borrowed the religion and building technology of their neighbors, the Byzantines, to build new cities and towns as the population spread. One of these outposts located in the fertile heart of Western Russia was called Moscow. Moscow, whose date of founding is officially given as 1147, was a small, uh, essentially log fort on a river by the name of Moscow, Moskva. As their cities developed, the Kievan Rus became known as Russians. But with no unified ruler or defenses, Russian cities were prime targets for invasion by the era's most aggressive conquerors, the Tatars. 1237, the Tatars charged across the Volga River with 120,000 riders. The early Russians were no match for this seasoned militia. For nearly 24 months, the Tatars devastated Russia. But for the rulers of Moscow, the invasion was an opportunity to buy favor with the invaders and rebuild better than before. Moscow's rise started in the 14th century, very clever, cunning, ruthless politics on the part of the Grand Princes of Moscow, who managed to ingratiate themselves with the Tartar masters and achieve the ability to collect taxes from the other Russian principalities. Under the protection of the Tatars, Moscow began to bleed its Russian brothers dry, swallowing up neighboring territories to form a single Muscovite state. But its leaders were still forced to pay off their hated Tatar overlords. All that would change in 1462 with Ivan III. Ivan came to power determined to end Tatar domination of Russia. He takes the title Grand Prince of All Russia and begins to plot an overthrow of the Tatars. 
Ivan, I think, had all of the characteristics he needed to be a good and successful Tsar uh, and to earn the title the Great. He was ambitious, he was opportunistic, he was ruthless, he was smart. The new Tsar would hit the ground running. He marries into the empire that had given Russia its religion and architecture, Byzantium. With this alliance in place, Ivan adopts the Byzantine symbol of the two-headed eagle and declares Russia the third Rome. Then in 1472, he begins to lay down his engineering legacy. He commissions a new cathedral to be built as an unmistakable sign that Russia was now a force to be reckoned with. Workers began construction on the massive project in the early 1470s. But Mother Nature had other ideas. In 1474, a small tremor shook Moscow. Two years of construction on the mighty church collapsed into a pile of rubble. Built crudely of heavy stone on insufficient foundations, it was an accident waiting to happen. But Ivan would turn disaster into opportunity. At this point, Ivan III does what any shrewd ruler would do, find the best people. And the best people of that period, the 15th century, were in Italy. Ivan finds one Aristotle Fioravanti. Fioravanti was known as a skilled master architect throughout Italy. But before he could re-engineer Moscow's cathedral, he had to completely demolish the site. In the first of several innovations, Fioravanti uses siege technology in the form of a battering ram to raise the ruins of the church. And that amazed the Muscovites. What they had taken months to erect unsuccessfully, he was able to batter down in three weeks. Fioravanti then got to work building the cathedral. Today we know it as the Cathedral of the Assumption. He began by using ancient Russian limestone churches as his model but infused the construction with Western building technology. The result revolutionized Russian architecture. We start with the foundation. Instead of the rubble-filled trench, which was typical of early medieval Russian building, he cleared the trench and put large oak pilings, which are much more stable means of supporting the building, so that the building doesn't later crack or deform in ways that will lead it to ultimately collapse. From there, Fiorvante's innovations expanded. Instead of using stacked pieces of limestone poorly mortared together, he arranges his limestone blocks in an interlocking bond to make them more stable. With his walls completed, he next turns to the delicate and dangerous operation of building the heavy vaulted ceilings. When you begin to vault the roof, there's an enormous amount of weight coming down on those walls. So the third element that he introduced was iron tie rods. Well, they were just iron rods that were inserted in the masonry and uh, extended across at the level of the vaulting. It uh, serves as an additional form of support. It ties the structure together. Last, instead of building the church's rounded cupolas and drums in heavy stone, he introduced the use of lighter and sturdier brick teaching his Russian builders how to fire and lay this new material. So that uh, from the pilings to the wall bonding, to the tie rods, to the upper structure, Fioravanti used a new set of techniques which had been mastered in Italy, but put them within the context of Russian symbols. The finished cathedral stood over 150 feet tall. It was a stunning and imposing edifice. With his symbol of power in place, Ivan was now ready to challenge the Tatars. Their response is quick. They raise a massive army and charge Moscow. Ivan raises his own force, and the two sides clash at the Ugra River, 300 miles west of Moscow. After months of standoff, the Russians finally overrun the Tatars. Ivan had successfully vanquished the oppressors who had subjugated the Russians for nearly three centuries. And with his legacy cemented in mighty monuments of brick and stone,
Ivan III becomes Ivan the Great. By the time of his death in 1505, Ivan had created an independent Russia, but he had not yet created an empire. That distinction would belong to another Ivan, whose absolute authority and inhuman cruelty would earn him the title Ivan the Terrible. In 1472, Ivan III married Sophia Paleologus, the niece of the last emperor of Byzantium. Pope Paul II arranged the marriage. At the end of Ivan the Great's reign in 1505, he had freed the Russian people from subservience to the Tatars and tripled Moscow's territory. In other words, it went from 15,000 square miles to 45,000 square miles, which was an enormous accomplishment in itself, and that would earn him the title the Great. But the Tatars were still a problem. Although they had retreated from Moscow, their capital, Kazan, stood in the way of Russia's expansion east. It would take the dark determination of Ivan III's grandson to rid Russia of the Tatars and transform it into an empire. He would become known as Ivan the Terrible. I think the greatest single period of expansion was under um, Ivan uh, the Terrible. The Muscovite Tsardom encompassed the Volga, the Euro regions, and then eventually all of uh, Siberia. This great emperor would start out as a deeply troubled young man. Ivan's father died when he was a child, leaving him witness to a brutal struggle for power involving torture, execution, and murder. These atrocities would scar Ivan for life. Ivan the Terrible's traumatic background as a child, I think, produced uh, and Ivan, who was terrible, uh, even a, as a young child, he tortured animals. He seemed to be cruel and sadistic. By the time he came to power in 1547, he was convinced that he was personally anointed by God to rule Russia. He was the first Russian ruler to have himself crowned formally as Tsar. And Tsar is simply a Russian derivative of Caesar. It's an imperial title. As Tsar, Ivan found the perfect outlet for his fierce and ruthless intellect by launching Russia's first modern offensive called the Siege of Kazan. Ivan first created a new army of nearly 150,000 men, including artillery and engineering units trained in the latest siege tactics from Europe. His engineers adapted these foreign teachings to suit Russian warfare. In a first for Russian engineering, they designed a portable structure to defend Russian troops on Eurasia's exposed plains. It was called the Gulai Gorod. This was actually a movable fortress. Gulai Gorod consisted of wooden screens or wooden boards. These shields were assembled in varying patterns to defend infantry gunners called strelsi, the Russian word for shooter. Russian infantry stood inside these movable fortress and used uh, guns, used cannons against the cavalry. And another way to use it was against the besieged city like Kazan. August 23rd, 1552, with his army assembled and equipped, Ivan begins fighting his way to Kazan. It was done very ingeniously as the Russians moved up and would very quickly erect prefabricated log fortresses as they inched ever closer to Kazan. In other words, tightening the noose around the city. Once entrenched outside the city, Ivan's troops unleashed a relentless assault rolling in 30-foot-high gulag rods to fire a barrage of artillery over the fortress walls. They killed many, many defenders in the streets of the city using these movable towers. But the fortress stood strong, so Ivan's generals ordered in a team of engineers to take a crack at the castle. They devise a daring plan to tunnel under the fortress walls, lay mines, and blow the fort wide open. On September 30th, they light a fuse that would decide the bloody fate of Kazan. 
the force of the explosion stops the battle in its tracks. That was the signal to, to the rest of the army, and all the regiments of the Tsarist army simultaneously started the assault of the fortress. Days of bloody battle, Kazan falls. Ivan was a conqueror, and Russia becomes an empire. This was a monumental feat uh, because the taking of Kazan uh, meant that uh, Russia was incorporating the former Tartar lands uh, to which she had been beholden. Uh, and Kazan opened the way for Russia to expand truly into an empire. It opened the way south to the Caspian and the Black Seas, and it opened the way east to Siberia. In 1555, to commemorate his victory, Ivan commissions a building that would become the most recognizable symbol of the Russian Empire. Today it's known as St. Basil's Cathedral. The Cathedral of the Intercession, which we know as St. Basil's, is based on the technology of brick towers that the Italians brought in and the Russians later adapted to create votive tower churches. Constructed almost entirely of brick, the cathedral was actually eight churches in one. It was laid out in a geometric pattern, with each church circling a central tower, symbolizing the eight days of the siege of Kazan. In the 1580s, the cathedral's most distinctive feature was added. The onion dome takes its form, its image, from that flare that occurs at its base. It rests on a cylinder called a drum, and from that cylinder, the top of that cylinder, it flares out very sharply, rises up, and then culminates in a peak. That is the onion dome. The onion domes on St. Basil's were completely unique. Each one was constructed of individually textured, hand-painted metal sheaths laid over an iron frame. If you strip that metal sheath away, it would look something like a birdcage that had been squashed so that you got the flare. The result was a stunning architectural feat never before seen in Russia. By 1553, Ivan's dominions were the largest in Europe, and he was at the height of his power. But his deepening paranoia and iron grip on the jugular of the nation were slowly strangling his empire. He launched a series of costly and foolish wars and sadistically struck out at anyone who opposed his power. The flames of Ivan's insanity were consuming his own people. And no one was safe, not even his own family. Another reason Ivan uh, IV could be called the terrible is probably the finale of his reign uh, when he murdered his son, who was trying to protect his pregnant wife from Ivan's rage. Ivan had beaten the woman so severely that she miscarried. When his son confronted him, Ivan turned on him too. In a blinding rage, he struck out, killing him instantly. With one swift move, Ivan had destroyed his own line of succession. By the time of his death in 1584, the empire was in a shambles. Soon after Ivan came the decade-long so-called time of troubles. A civil war combined with a war of foreign intervention. In the course of that, Muscovy, Russia, came very close to losing its independence. Just one century after achieving independence, Russia was on the brink of disaster. But soon, a Russian giant would appear on the world stage, stunning everyone by engineering a shining city in the middle of nowhere. Ivan the Terrible married seven times and even proposed to a lady in the court of Queen Elizabeth I of England. 1696. A new czar comes to power with a revolutionary plan to pick up where Ivan the Terrible left off and transform his backward nation into a modern empire. His name is Peter the Great. Peter the Great was an absolutely unique person. 
a giant, both physically, six and a half feet tall, as well as in terms of personality. He disregarded convention and tradition. He was endlessly curious about new things. Peter's enormous size was matched by his ego. A constant whirlwind of activity occurred around him, uh, and he uh, took on the tasks of a dozen men. He was really an extraordinary, larger-than-life person. Peter had spent his early years in Moscow, carousing with artisans and military men in the city's foreign quarter, learning about their tactics and technology. Peter was not only entranced with European technology, he was also very aware of Russia's backwardness and weakness vis-a-vis -vis Europe. He wanted to remedy that situation. So one of his first acts was he went to Europe, and he went to Europe incognito. And there he studied the craft of shipbuilding with the Dutch, who were masters at it. He also learned the art of navigation from the English Navy. And he saw the great wealth these European empires were pulling out of their overseas colonies, and he figured they might have use for Russian natural resources. But what Peter really wanted was a piece of the action. And he knew that in order to cut into the pie, he would have to drag his country kicking and screaming out of its gloomy medieval backwardness into the great white light of the new commercialism of the Western world. When he got back to Russia, Peter resolved to transform his country into a naval force that would not only trade with the European empires, it would compete with them as a military power. Peter sets his sights on a stretch of land 400 miles north of Moscow, near the Baltic Sea on the Neva River. With godlike vanity, he began envisioning a new naval city that would put Russia on Europe's map. He would call his vision St. Petersburg. A city on that spot had direct maritime access to Europe. The only problem was that this land on the Neva belonged to Sweden. Peter would not be deterred. In 1700, he launched an all-out attack and took the land by force. By 1703, the cornerstone of the city was laid. The new capital that Peter had in mind, it was to be a fortress, was to be the center of the army and the navy. It was to be the window on Europe through which Western ideas, modern ideas, were going to flood and spread throughout the entire empire. Out of bloodshed and warfare, St. Petersburg was born. But for the people of Russia, their Tsar's ambition would prove to be a double-edged sword. Peter chose the site of his future city for its access to the Baltic Sea, but this advantage would come with a steep price. For five months out of the year, the River Delta and its surrounding swamps would freeze, and then predictably and reliably flood when they thawed with the warmer months. The building of this city would be a monumental challenge. So Peter turned to the one natural resource that compensated in Russia when all else failed, raw manpower. The people of Russia would literally build St. Petersburg with their bare hands. Surrounded by nothing but swamp, supplies were almost impossible to come by. In order to raise the foundations of the fortress above tide waters, workers had to dig piles of earth with their bare hands and then transport thousands of pounds of soil in their jackets and shirts. Everything had to be imported. Even lumber had to be cut upstream and floated down in huge quantities to stabilize the city's foundations. There's no bedrock there, so that any large structure had to be built on pilings. To do this, engineers designed a pulley system to drive thousands of piles into the soft earth. And you raise the, uh, the head, and they would drop it, and that would drive the pile into the ground. And uh, this was repeated tens of thousands of times Petersburg. Within five months, thousands and thousands of laborers had erected the hexagonal walls and the timber bastions of this fortress you see behind me. At night, they'd come home to their camps, freezing and tired and hungry. And just as they had come by the thousands, so they would die by the thousands from disease, from the flooding, and from exhaustion. By 1708, a rough estimate of 25,000 laborers had perished, building this fledgling city, which gave rise to its nickname, the City of Bones.
There is no statistic that tells us exactly how many people died before this city was finished. But a 19th century historian says that up until that point, there was no single battle in the annals of military history that cost as many lives as the number of laborers who perished in the building of St. Petersburg. For Peter, the human toll was merely a means to an end. In 1706, he launched his first warship from St. Petersburg Admiralty Shipyard. This was the city's first industrial compound. It housed shipbuilders, sail and rope makers, forges, and a cannon foundry. Russia now had a navy, and its czar was single-handedly changing the face of the empire. In 1712, with his usual brisk efficiency, he makes the biggest change of all. In a simple and stunning decree, Peter makes St. Petersburg the capital of Russia. In an instant, Moscow's nearly 300-year supremacy in Russia was over. The citizens of Moscow were stunned. Many Russians reacted to Peter as though he were an alien from outer space. They didn't understand him. He imposed his strange ideas on his country using the full force of an autocratic and absolute monarch, which he inherited from his predecessors, but he knew very well uh, how to use it to get his will. His vision to revolutionize Russia was the thing that drove him throughout his life. Nothing and no one escaped some kind of an effect from this revolutionary process. Peter had spared no expense to create a city from scratch. But by 1714, St. Petersburg was still a long way from being the European power center he envisioned. And Peter's years of hard living were about to catch up with him. Without his dogged will, the entire fantastic endeavor threatened to crumble, leaving Russia once again on the verge of chaos. In 1698, Peter the Great issued a beard tax to be paid by anyone refusing to cut off their old-fashioned Russian beards in favor of a clean-shaven Western look. For decades, Peter the Great had been monastically focused on his twofold task of turning Russia into a great empire and St. Petersburg into its glittering capital. With one exception, he still held his legendary bouts of drinking with his buddies. But as always, his hard partying had very little effect on his relentless energy. He defeated Sweden in the Great Northern War. He'd extended Russia's boundaries from the Baltic all the way to the Pacific. He built a new European capital. He built a navy. He built schools of engineering and science, and he'd increased Russian trade sevenfold. Military and politically, Russia had become an empire, but it still lacked the one element essential to all empires, prestige. In 1714, Peter began sketching designs for a grand palace atop a 50-foot bluff overlooking the sea. 25 miles outside of St. Petersburg. He would call it Peterhof. The palace would be surrounded by over 600 acres of gardens and crowned by a gilded network of fountains running down the entire face of the bluff. Work on the monumental project began in 1716. A large numbers of army soldiers were actually sent to the estate to dig uh, the trenches that would feed the water through a pipe system to the fountains. In 1719, the country's first hydraulic engineers began work on the intricate system. The palace was built on the heights, and the heights are what feed the water. It's that drop, the gravity in that drop that actually powers the fountains. Using the natural slope of the terrain and water from nearby springs, workers constructed a 14-mile gravity-fed system. The water was stored in upper reservoirs. In a flash, it was released to shoot through wooden pipes down a 50-foot cascade to the fountain's centerpiece. The speeding water accumulated enough force to shoot 65 feet into the air. The result was breathtaking. The fountains were so spectacular, they were dubbed Russia's Versailles. But Peter didn't have much time to enjoy his showpiece. In 1725, 
after wading into freezing water to save a drowning sailor, the great Peter took ill and died. By the end of his reign, Peter had taken Russia from a backward, isolated country to a state-of-the-art empire. But the job was far from done. It would be the ambitious and tenacious German wife of Peter's grandson who would complete St. Petersburg's transformation from a naval fort to the glittering capital we recognize great. Catherine comes to power uh, in the year 1762 by overthrowing her husband, uh, who had been uh, the Russian emperor for only six months. Uh, and she very was able to quite easily topple him. With her power secure, Catherine picks up where Peter the Great left off, transforming Russia into a world power. As a foreigner, as a European, she virtually completed the process of Europeanization, which Peter the Great uh, had begun at the beginning of the century. In fact, Catherine regarded herself as Peter's rightful heir. In the 18th century, in order to be a successful monarch, you had to expand your territory, and this Catherine did brilliantly. Catherine annexed some 200,000 square miles of territory, adding vast new wealth to Russia's coffers, and expanding the empire to its greatest lengths to date. Second, you were to introduce a wide-ranging program of reform, and this she did. On the home front, Catherine used her new wealth to modernize her city. She was one of the first Russian rulers to address the squalid living conditions of Russia's poor, with plans for hospitals, sanitation, services, and schools. Catherine, during her reign, um, set up architectural norms for the building of new towns. And she did, in fact, build 216 new towns, uh, complete with plans for how the grid should be laid out, how the central square should be laid out, uh, what kind of facades there should be, what kind of materials should be used in construction. But Catherine's most prestigious building project was the renovation of her royal residence, the empire's most extravagant monument to self-indulgence, the Winter Palace. The Winter Palace was three stories high and 650 feet long. The entire exterior was decorated in more than 200 columns and over 150 carved statues. Inside, it contained more than 500 rooms, almost four times the number of rooms in the White House. Over the course of her reign, Catherine spearheaded a building boom unlike any the empire had ever seen. Her unrivaled power completely transformed St. Petersburg into an ostentatious and unashamed display of the culture, wealth, and power of the Russian Empire. She wrote to one of her correspondents, I can't stop myself from building, but building is like a disease. It's almost like alcoholism. Unrestrained building wasn't the Tsarina's only vice. Behind the doors of the Winter Palace, Catherine was known for another form of patronage, taking good care of her numerous and often much younger lovers. She was a hard-working woman. At night, she wanted to have male company. And there were a number of lovers. She treated them very nicely and very generously. She gave them land. She gave them serfs. But Catherine's lavish court and her absolute power to give human beings as gifts symbolized the gulf that existed between the ruling elite and the average laboring Russian. While she sympathized with her subjects, on the throne of supreme power, Catherine's reforms went only so far. By the end of Catherine's reign in 1796, Russia was a superpower. But the country's strength brought it new glory and new enemies. By 1812, Europe's most ambitious general was engaged in a march of conquest across Europe, unlike any seen since the Roman Empire, and Russia was about to become his next victim. Catherine the Great was the first leader to initiate a large-scale inoculation program. In 1768, she immunized herself and her subjects against smallpox. At the time of her death in 1796, Catherine had added 200,000 square miles of territory to the Russian Empire. 
over 40 million people were now considered Russians. When her grandson, Alexander I, took the throne in 1801, Russia was a major player in world affairs. This made Russia an alluring trophy for Europe's most dangerous general, Napoleon Bonaparte. And in 1812, Tsar Alexander would face a challenge unseen in Russia since the Mongol invasion six centuries earlier. Napoleon posed a considerable threat to uh, Russia. He had already brought virtually all of Europe under his control. Napoleon entered Russia with an unprecedented army of over 500,000 men. The Russians knew they could not stop this army on the battlefield, so they adopted a tactic of strategic retreat, burning the countryside to starve out Napoleon's troops as they pushed toward Moscow. Once in the capital, Napoleon would realize he had underestimated the steely resolve of the Russian Tsar. Napoleon probably thought that having invaded Russia, seized the old capital, Alexander would be willing to come to terms with him. Alexander was not. He simply ignored Napoleon until a very harsh winter forced Napoleon to realize that there was nothing to be gained by sitting in Moscow, and so Napoleon began to retreat. Forced to march back over the demolished and frozen landscape from which they came, less than 10% of the men out of Napoleon's original army survived. Mother Russia had broken the unbeatable general. In 1883, Alexander's successor commissioned a grand monument to be placed in the heart of St. Petersburg's Palace Square. It would be a towering symbol of Russian defiance. It was called the Alexander Column. The Alexander Column rests on a granite shaft, red finish granite. It's a monolith, it's one piece. Once again, a Russian czar forced his people to literally move mountains to build a monument in the name of the empire. An army of Russians methodically carved the shaft of the column out of the side of a mountain in one piece and shipped it to St. Petersburg. It was a process that took three years and thousands of workers. Once in St. Petersburg, engineers faced the daunting task of raising the 700-ton, 83-foot-tall granite monolith. It was sort of a giant halter. It was fastened onto the column. And then placed around it were capstans, which were manned by dozens of people. And at a given signal, they would all move, and through a pulley system, the column would gradually move upward and fall into the place that had been prepared for it on the base. Today, the column remains freestanding on its pedestal at a full height of 155 feet. It has proved to be absolutely perfectly engineered. Napoleon's collapse eliminated any threat to Russia's status as the world's largest overland empire. By the turn of the 19th century, Russia stretched 6,000 miles from the Baltic Sea in the west to the Pacific in the east and all the way to Alaska. It consisted of one-sixth of the world's landmass, crossed 15 time zones, and under a new czar, it would continue expanding. And Nicholas II, because of his early experience traveling in Asia, the first of the czars to travel to Asian destinations, took into his reign a real conviction that Russia's future lay on the Pacific. But with its territory now extending beyond the horizon, the empire was in danger of collapsing under its own size. Russia's engineers would execute a solution as far-reaching as the empire itself. They would build the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Those who promoted the building of what was then the world's longest railroad in the 1890s had in mind uh, both economic and political objectives. It was to open up the Far East to Russian exports. At the same time, it was to establish Russian power in the Far East. On May 31st, 1891, 
The first piece was laid of a railroad that would span a distance of 5,768 miles, the equivalent of crossing the continental United States twice. This was an engineering project on a scale never before attempted. The question of how the railway was built is, a, is a, frankly one that makes you sort of stop in awe. The railroad was designed to be built in sections, and it would require thousands of workers, engineers, soldiers, and even convicts to do the job. In a typical stretch of the railway cutting across um, um, vast areas of southern Siberian forest, an initial wave of workers would clear the land, felling the trees to open the path for the railroad. Then a great deal of labor would go into building necessary earth bulwarks to raise the rails. Then once the woods were cleared and the bulwark was established, the rails would be brought in and laid. Transporting supplies to these remote sites would prove to be a major challenge. After all, the railroad did not yet exist. Tracks had to be laid piecemeal so that workers could use the emerging railroad to transport steel from the west and continue building section by section. And this process was repeated uh, week after week, month after month, over all the years of the late uh, imperial period. The endless toil broke the backs of Russia's workers. It was a very hard job to take, very hard job to take. I mean, you got to conjure an image of isolated wilderness that was transformed into rough and ready workers' camps, with uh, workers camped out under tents, uh, or, or in some cases in earthen dugouts, uh, working for months at a time on stretches of track with uh, relatively limited supplies in the winter, uh, subject to extremely cold temperatures in the summer, to the terrific heat of uh, Russia's continental climate. By 1904, the core railroad was complete. Russia had a lifeline to the east and was free to pursue its next object of conquest, Asia. The problem, of course, was that this put Russia into direct conflict with Japan, which had very similar political and economic objectives. This conflict of objectives led to war between Russia and Japan. In 1905, Russia went to war and suffered a humiliating defeat at the hands of the Japanese. Back at home, the loss fanned the flames of growing resentment toward the Tsar. Then in 1914, the Tsar led his country into yet another war, one that would starve, ravage, and utterly decimate the population. World War I. After centuries of building the world's largest empire with blood, the Russian Tsar was now pushing his people to their breaking point. On March 15, 1917, the people revolted. Tsar Nicholas II was removed from power. The nearly 500-year reign of the Russian Tsars had been destroyed. The key factor in the disintegration of the Russian Empire in 1917-18 was the collapse of the Tsarist regime, because it was the emperor who really provided the glue that held the empire together. The Tsars had used their power to build breathtaking cathedrals, whole cities from swamps, railroads that crossed a continent, and sumptuous palaces that remain unrivaled in their opulence. The history of the Russian Empire can be read as an enormous achievement. At the same time, that achievement came at important costs. In many respects, the empire was built on the backs of ordinary Russians. In late 1917, the Tsar's achievements would be rewritten by a new regime, one determined to level the playing field for Russia's poor. As the mighty empire grew, it would consume more and more of its own to build a palatial playground for the rich and an industrial hell for the rest. By the beginning of the 20th century, Russia's overworked and illiterate poor had had it. Broken by world war, incited by radicals, these people would rise up to demolish the Russia they had suffered for in a fiery revolution that would replace one colossal empire with another. I'm Peter Weller for the History Channel.
the new Tsar would hit the ground running. He marries into the empire that had given Russia its religion and architecture, Byzantium. With this alliance in place, Ivan adopts the Byzantine symbol of the two-headed eagle and declares Russia the third Rome. Then in 1472, he begins to lay down his engineering legacy. He commissions a new cathedral to be built as an unmistakable sign that Russia was now a force to be reckoned with. Workers began construction on the massive project in the early 1470s. But Mother Nature had other ideas. In 1474, a small tremor shook Moscow. Two years of construction on the mighty church collapsed into a pile of rubble. Built crudely of heavy stone on insufficient foundations, it was an accident waiting to happen. But Ivan would turn disaster into opportunity. At this point, Ivan III does what any shrewd ruler would do, find the best people. And the best people of that period, the 15th century, were in Italy. For nearly 24 months, the Tatars devastated Russia. But for the rulers of Moscow, the invasion was an opportunity to buy favor with the invaders and rebuild better than before. Moscow's rise had started in the 14th century, very clever, cunning, ruthless politics on the part of the Grand Princes of Moscow, who managed to ingratiate themselves with the Tartar masters and achieve the ability to collect taxes from the other Russian principalities. Under the protection of the Tatars, Moscow began to bleed its Russian brothers dry, swallowing up neighboring territories to form a single Muscovite state. But its leaders were still forced to pay off their hated Tatar overlords. All that would change in 1462 with Ivan III. Ivan came to power determined to end Tatar domination of Russia. He takes the title Grand Prince of All Russia and begins to plot an overthrow of the Tatars. Ivan, I think, had all of the characteristics he needed to be a good and successful Tsar uh, and to earn the title the Great. He was ambitious, he was opportunistic, he was ruthless, he was smart. 1480, Moscow. An up-and-coming Russian leader is making an unprecedented play for power. His name is Ivan III. For centuries, his people have been under the thumb of Eurasia's most brutal conquerors, a Mongol sect called the Tatars. But now, Ivan III would gamble everything to take them down. In one move, he tears up the pact, binding him to the Tatars, and declares Russia his. In the balance hangs the future of the Russian people, if Ivan loses, it means his life. If he wins, Russia will become the land of the czars. Hello, I'm Peter Weller. Some say the history of Russia is a history of its great cities. Now, what we think of as Russia today actually began in the ninth century, when a very diverse people started to coalesce around a single dominant clan called the Kievan Rus. The Kievan Rus were from the Ukraine, but they migrated here to a very forested area around many rivers and lakes and started a small trading hamlet called Novgorod, meaning new city. Oral tradition tells us that life in Novgorod was so chaotic and so tumultuous that the people actually invited a Viking warrior named Rurik from across the Baltic Sea to come here and establish order. In Novgorod, the Kievan Rus flourished. They borrowed the religion and building technology of their neighbors, the Byzantines, to build new cities and towns as the population spread. One of these outposts located in the fertile heart of Western Russia was called Moscow. Moscow, whose date of founding is officially given as 1147, was a small, uh, essentially log fort on a river by the name of Moscow, Moskva. As their cities developed, the Kievan Rus became known as Russians. 
But with no unified ruler or defenses, Russian cities were prime targets for invasion by the era's most aggressive conquerors, the Tatars. 1237, the Tatars charged across the Volga River with 120,000 riders. The early Russians were no match for this seasoned militia. was an empire that rose out of the ashes of barbarian conquest, straddled 15 time zones, and swallowed one-sixth of the entire world's landmass. The first thing to deal with is just this enormous size. Fueled by 400 years of chaos, the Russian Empire was forged by a lion's den of larger-than-life czars, whose tyrannical designs were as colossal as the country itself. She wrote to one of her correspondents, I can't stop myself from building. Building is like a disease. It's almost like alcoholism. These visionaries would drive Russia's rise to greatness, adapting foreign technologies to seize power, capture territory, and engineer an empire. But the same drive that fueled Russia's thirst for everlasting glory would ultimately devour its own people.